Welcome to the Line Movement MMA Betting Show. I'm Daniel Levy from Best Fight Picks and Half the Battle. Joined now by James Lynch. Today we're going to be talking UFC Vegas 14 because Paul Felder just stepped up on short notice. He's going to be taking on Rafael Dos Anjos in the main event. We're going to get right down to business here in a second. But first, we got to let our Canadian listeners know to go to blitzbet.eu. And James Lynch, second week in a row, you're filling in for Dan Tom. I really appreciate you stepping up. How you doing today? I'm doing well. I really appreciate you having me back on. On, man this was uh, it was fun last week i know we're gonna have a lot of fun today uh pretty pretty good you know this car got a lot of flack but i'm actually you know look digging through it a little bit it's gonna be a good one this weekend it really is i know it's it's cliche to say it's those cars that everyone criticizes that always end up being the funnest but i mean this is gonna be fun i mean when's the last time you saw a boring paul felder fight uh, you got the legend rafael dos Anjos taking him on and then also the co-main event i know that these aren't the biggest names but abdul razak al hassan and chaos williams i know his name is chaos but that fight is going to be chaos james lynch absolutely and and there's a lot of close fights on here we're going to dig into some of these matchups but you look at the betting odds on blitzbet.eu uh, you're going to see a lot of close fights here, and there's a lot of intangibles. There's so much to discuss on this card, and that that makes it a lot more fun for me, just because you know it's not like a you know squash match or big favorite or something like that. It's you're getting a lot of competitive matchups on this card. Well, without further ado, let's break down this main event between Paul Felder and Rafael Dos Anjos. And man, this is the complete opposite of the original matchup between uh, Rafael Dos Anjos and Islam Makachev, which, you know, the odds were like minus 500 to minus 600 for Islam Makachev. Now you're looking at somewhat of a closer line here with Rafael Dos Anjos being the favorite in the spot. And you want to know an interesting uh, uh, number here, James, is that oftentimes, especially in these days, you think of Rafael Dos Anjos as the older fighter. Actually, Paul Felder is older than Rafael Dos Anjos by, by I believe, six or so months. So man, that's kind of interesting to me. But as far as, you know, breaking it down stylistically, when you put Rafael Dos Anjos in there with wrestlers, especially nowadays, that tends to be his weakness. I know you saw the Colby Covington fight, the Kamaru Usman fight, and Leon Edwards. He mixed in the wrestling really nicely. We, we kind of thought that Islam Makachev was going to do the same thing. But now you got Paul Felder taking this fight on five-day short notice, and these two are going to stand and bang in the center of the octagon, give the fans a real main event. And I feel like if anyone's going to shoot takedowns this one, it's actually going to be Dos Anjos, James. Absolutely. And you know that he has the advantage on the ground. We don't really see Paul uh, Paul Felder tested that much on the mat. So if you've got it in your back pocket, why not use it? Why risk standing and trading with a Paul Felder? I mean, we've seen the highlight reel knockouts. We've seen the fact that this guy can go a full five rounds with a, a Dan Hooker in his last fight. I don't think if you're Dos Anjos, you want to risk that. Also factoring in that Dos Anjos moving back down to 155 for the first time since 2016. We know what happens when you cut weight. You tend to not to retain, retain as much water. So you're more susceptible to the knockout. If you remember Eddie Alvarez finished Dos Anjos in the first round to win the title. Um, you know, it's possible it could happen here with Paul Felder. So if you're Dos Anjos, you're looking to take this to the mat. And you're looking to utilize your jujitsu as opposed to trying to play to Paul Felder's strength, which is a striking. So I, I talked about, you know, off the top, this be, you know, there being, uh, you know, a lot of uh, even fights in this one. This is one of them because there's a lot of variables that go into this fight as well. You mentioned the age. How about the height and reach? Paul Felder, 5'11 with a 70.5 inch reach. Dos Anjos, 5'8 with a 70 inch reach. Like, Physically, they're very similar too, right? So uh, there's a lot of stuff we'll, I'm sure we'll dip, dive into a little bit more. But to answer your question, yeah, if you're Dos Anjos, you want to take this to the mat. I'm really glad you brought up the weight cutting angle because obviously, you know, Dos Anjos, as he's getting up there in age, he's done his last few fights at 170. The cut's getting tougher to 55, but he has had a full camp here. So I think that, you know, I mean, at least I heard that he was under 170 a couple days ago because there were there were talks about getting him, you know, an, a welterweight fight for the replacement for Islam Makachev. And in comes Paul Felder, who historically has had very tough cuts to 155. And James Lynch, this is not a full camp. This is a five-day notice. But this is a guy who's been training for a marathon or a triathlon, I believe. So his weight has been low as a result. But that being said, you know, he hasn't been sparring. He hasn't been wrestling. So I'm curious to see if his timing is going to be on on Saturday night. And where does Paul Felder mainly train, Dan? Rufus Sport. We talked about this last week, about how that camp has sort of been broken up a little bit. Brendan Allen training at Sanford MMA. May. You've got Bilal Muhammad not training there. So what? even if he was in Milwaukee, which I know he wasn't, I mean, he wasn't going to get a good camp anyway. So uh, that is an important thing to, to point out in this fight. People forget too, Rafael Dos Anjos was supposed to fight Islam Makashev at UFC 254. They actually moved that fight to this weekend. So Dos Anjos knew for a very long time that he was going to have a fight at 155. So I thought about the weight cut thing as well, being like, you know, Dos Anjos older. Typically older fighters when they drop down a weight class don't do too well. But the fact that he had a lot of notice for this and the fact that he, you know, this fight was already supposed to take place a 
few weeks ago gives me hope that Dos Anjos will make weight. So I don't. I think if anything, the weight cut's going to be a bit easier on Dos Anjos because he's preparing for a fight. Paul uh, Felder was preparing to go for a swim and a bike and uh, everything else, which is a lot different than fighting uh, Rafael Dos Anjos. So that is one thing to consider. Also, we got to throw in the fact that Paul Felder's a commentator. There's a lot of traveling that's involved with that. Dos Anjos' only job is to fight. So that's another thing to kind of look at here with this matchup because, you know, you would tend to favor a Paul Felder just with the fact that he's, you know, been in the lightweight division over the last couple of years a lot longer than Dos Anjos has being at welterweight. But like I said, it's a short notice fight. And let's also not forget that when Paul Felder had a short notice fight a couple of years ago against Mike Perry, that was a welterweight fight. So we do know, like you mentioned, that Felder has a tough cut. All the power to him for for trying to have this fight at 155. Uh, you know, I think he knows the importance of where a win would put him. That's probably why this is at 155. But um, I, I think if we're looking at the weight cut in this fight, I think Dos Anjos actually has that advantage because he already knew that he was going to be fighting. Yeah, 100 percent. And I mean, the fans got to love a guy like Paul Felder, not just because, you know, his fighting style is so exciting. The guy comes to bang, win, lose or drive every single time. But to save the main event, to go out there five days notice, make that impossible cut and to save the show. I mean, that's what legends are made of. And we know in his last fight against Dan Hooker, he actually said that that might be his last fight and it would take something serious to bring him out of retirement. And this is that serious opportunity. So we're going to see what he's got, man, because look, Rafael Dos Anjos, he has had the full camp, but one could argue that he's not too far from retirement himself either. So both guys kind of towards the end of the road, but both very skilled fighters nonetheless too, James Lynch. Absolutely. And I want to point out something as well, because people look at the losing streak with Rafael Dos Anjos and you look at the fact he's like back-to-back back -back fights, four of his last five, but who's he losing to, Dan? That's the big thing here, because I've seen a lot of people this week being like, RDA's ready to, not, not pointing you out, because you did mention the R word, but in general, I see a lot of people saying Dos Anjos is done. We really don't know if that's the case here because of the fact that he's fighting high-level guys at welterweight. Chiesa, okay, maybe he would have liked that one back, but Leon Edwards is close to fighting for a title. Kamara Usman is the welterweight champion. Colby Covington was the interim champion. And then in between there, he's got a pretty impressive win over Kevin Lee, who last time I checked was back at lightweight. So really that to me sort of counts as a lightweight win in itself, even though it was at welterweight. Dos Anjos to me, uh, I think he's just fighting really tough guys. Same thing with Paul Felder though, Edson Barbosa, Dan Hooker. Those are top-notch guys as well. But this idea that, that Dos Anjos has sort of fallen off a cliff, I believe that if, if a Usman or Covington or Edwards or any of these guys or Chiesa is finishing Edwards in the first round, but he's still in some of these fights you know so it's not like he's going out there and getting finished he's losing decisions so I, I think uh you know when you're looking at this fight from sort of the last you know the recency bias so to speak um you know I thought Paul Felder beat Dan Hooker if you look at the MMA decisions right now I think most people felt like he beat Dan Hooker in terms of that matchup but in general I don't think Dos Anjos is as bad as everyone's making it out to be and I think absolutely he's the rightful favorite in this fight on Saturday yeah, and back to the stylistic part that you brought up earlier about the takedowns of uh, Rafael Dos Anjos. You know, we've seen guys who aren't exactly known for, you know, wrestling go out there and take down Paul Felder. I'm talking about guys like Edson Barboza and Dan Hooker, who are both renowned for their striking abilities. They were able to successfully secure takedowns on a guy like Paul Felder. You know for a fact that Rafael Dos Anjos is getting ready to fight Islam Makachev. You know that wrestling was a big... Well, it was something that he put a lot of time into for that camp. So I agree with you. He's probably going to come out here, try to get this to the mat. And But look, on the feet, he's no slouch either. I mean, uh, you saw that fight when he won the title against Anthony Showtime Pettis. Uh, really a well-rounded MMA performance, but, you know, you heard him badly standing. You know that southpaw stance, the kicks to the liver, the whole bit. He's got the Kings MMA striking as well. Even though he doesn't train there anymore, he does have that background. So now it's prediction time. I'm leaning towards Rafael Dos Anjos, man. I mean, I think that... Obviously, you know, it kind of makes sense with him having the full camp and Paul taking this on short notice. But but more so than that, I actually think the activity rate of Rafael Dos Anjos is a little bit higher in this spot. And I think he can hang on the feet with a guy like Paul Felder. But if things do get kind of sketchy on the feet, I think he's got a plan B, which is to mix it up, get this to the mat and use uh, show off his uh, high level uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu background. But look, James, we've seen him outstrike good strikers, too. Like I've mentioned, Anthony Pettis, Robbie Lawler. I know you remember that fight. But in other fights, you know, you remember when he calf kicked uh, Neil Magny one time, got on top and finished the fight with a submission, too, with an arm triangle. So... I think Rafael's got more paths to victory, and uh, so for that reason, I'm actually going to pick him here. And I'm really curious to see how the line goes on Blitzbet.eu closer to fight time because, you know, Felder is a fan favorite. We love him. We love him for stepping up here. We love him as the commentator. That does play into people's minds a little bit. And like I said, I think a lot of the narrative that I'm hearing is that Dos Anjos is done. We really don't know if that's the case because he is fighting high-level guys. As far as my pick, 
I'm going with you as well. I like Dos Anjos in this one, mainly for the fact that this is such an even fight on paper in terms of the intangibles. And also just, you know, like I said, their age, they're similar. It's not like Dos Anjos is ancient. Felder, like you said, the older one. But it's for me, it's about the fact that he knew he had a fight coming up. He was getting ready for a fight. Paul Felder thought about retirement. You know, now he's coming in and stepping up all the power to him. But I got to go with the guy who knew he was fighting, and that's Dos Anjos. I'm going to take him by decision here, Dan, just because of the fact that Paul Felder, very difficult to finish. Um, it's possible, like I said, if Dos Anjos gets us to the ground, we can really see what type of jiu-jitsu Felder has. We don't really see it in a lot of his fights, but uh, I feel more comfortable picking uh, Dos Anjos here. But this is going to be a great fight and great main event. And, and, you know, it's very rare to have a really good replacement come in here, but we've got one here on Saturday night. I mean, great point about the durability of a guy like Paul Felder. Never, you know, been finished except for that one time in Brazil with a cut stoppage by uh, Francisco Trinaldo. So, I mean, you really got to bust this guy up to, to get him out of there. And, you know, again, big credit to Paul Felder, man, because not only is he taking this on five-day short notice, James, but, you know, he wasn't out here asking for it to be at 170 pounds. He wasn't asking for it to be a three-round main event. This guy said, I'm going to compete for a five-round main event at 155 pounds. You know, and like that's a uh, th that's that's some real stuff right there, James Lynch. So you got to give all the credit in the world to Paul Felder. But uh, I think we're both on Rafael Dos Anjos here. So let's see what happens Saturday night. We will. Let's see how we are the rest of the card. Let's see if we disagree, Dan. That's always makes things interesting. Absolutely. So the co-main event in the evening in the welterweight division, we got Abdul Razak Al-Hassan taking on Kalen Chaos Williams. And man, this is going to be an unbelievable fight. I really think that these two are going to stand and trade it in the center of the octagon until one man goes down. And if this does go all three rounds, I think it's going to, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to figure out who would shoot for the first takedown here. You know what I mean? <laughs> these two are... Uh, Serious knockout artist, and I know Razak Al Hassan was coming off a layoff his last fight, and I know he missed weight, but I, I heard you know from some people that trained with him that he's in way better shape for this one. That he's not only is he going to make weight, but he's he's got the gas to to go all three this time. So I'm really happy to hear that. And for Chaos Williams, you know it'd be nice to see him go longer than 30 seconds this time, James. And I mean not to discredit that performance against Morano. Great job, you got him out of there right away. Knock out of the night, beautiful job. But I, I have a feeling it's not going to be so easy to get Razak out in 30 seconds. I'm with you here. I hate to bore our audience here, but I I knew you'd have kind of the same feeling about uh, Razak al Hassan as I do uh, in this fight. I think he's kind of being overlooked, even though he is the betting favorite in this fight. But I mean, let, let's look at this. We know the battle yet outside the cage with that long layoff of him not fighting. Imagine, you know, having to take that into, into consideration, having the long layoff, having to go and, and take a fight on relatively short notice and then miss weight. I mean, that's got to mess with your head. It's not like Razak al Hassan is a young buck. He is a guy in his 30s. So... I mean, uh, you know, when that happens, it's, you know, it's worst case scenario. And he didn't look very good in that fight. But I think this fight will be a different story. The other thing that's kind of interesting, I haven't heard a lot of people talk about, there's probably a little bit of revenge in this one, right? Because who is Razak al Hassan's teammate? Alex Morono, who Chaos Williams knocked out in his last fight. And that was a weird card because if you remember on UFC 247, a lot of the Fortis guys ended up losing. A lot of the Fortis fighters. You wonder if that played a role in Morono's fight as well. I don't want to, you know, look past that victory for Chaos Williams. Absolutely legit. But I do wonder if his teammates losing played a role in that, that loss as well. But I'm a believer in Razak Al Hassan. I think this guy has some of the best knockout power in the welterweight division. And like I mentioned, 35 years old, but I still think he packs a punch. And, you know, you look at some of his wins now, they're looking even better as, as time goes on. Nico Price, I mean, that's a good win that he had where he finished him in that fight. Sabah Hamasi, I know he's not in the UFC anymore, Dan, but he's been lighting it up in Bellator. He got that really big one over Curtis Millinder, knocked out Bobby Volker. Sabah Hamasi looks like one of those fighters the UFC probably regrets letting go. And I just think in general, uh, it, it's going to stay standing. And I just, I to me, I do favor Al Hassan in this fight. I just think uh, he is the better striker. And one of the things that we kind of forget too with Chaos Williams is you look down that record, there's not a lot of good opponents there. Whereas Razak Al Hassan has been a mainstay in the UFC for quite some time, you know, fought really high level guys, including Omar Yakmadov and, you know, a lot of really just talented guys in that division. So, um, I agree with the odds here on blitzbet.eu. I, I am going to pick Razak Al Hassan in this fight. And I do think if it's stays standing, he has the edge here. If anything, I might take him inside the distance because I do see a finish in this fight. You know, it's interesting you brought up that point about Alex Morano and how he had, you know, a bunch of teammates on that card in Houston. It didn't go their way. And I actually heard an interview with him and prior to that fight and after the fight. And he was talking about how his last time in Houston, he actually lost to Nico Price. And he feels like he's got too much pressure when he's fighting there. You know, everybody's hitting him up for tickets. He can't really focus on the fight as much as he wants to. And he thought second time was going to be the charm. And it wasn't. It happened again. And so you saw in the, the thrill and the agony um, 
of defeat you know um that that show that uh, that ufc does on fight pass that he was like man in houston once again like so he was basically like i'm never fighting in houston ever again <laughs> so right. that's kind of like a little interesting thing there but ba- back to this matchup um so chaos williams he kind of reminds me of like a welterweight Derek brunson a little bit like he's got the athleticism he's got the power kind of likes to charge in w- with his chin straight up in the air and against certain guys you're going to be able to get away with that for sure just just based off the raw power the kind of athleticism this kid's got and he's got a wrestling back background too man and uh you know he's been doing his thing it's just that against a guy like Razak al Hassan, he's one of these guys that it's tough for me to bet against just the god-given power he brings to the table man uh he's from cameroon obviously you know about the african fighters there they're very serious obviously kamaru uzman francis Ngannou, among others you know israel adesanya and then you got uh Razak al Hassan, man it's just hard for me to bet against a guy like him and the kind of power he brings to the table he's also got a, a judo background too which we don't often see because he's usually knocking people out or standing and trading but i think uh the reason i bring that up is because if chaos wants to mix in takedowns i don't think it's going to be that easy i think that the times we've seen Razak get taken down was you know he kind of emptied the clip trying to knock these guys out and it was more of a cardio thing than it was you know a lack of takedown defense type ordeal whereas i hear he's in really good shape for this fight i think he's going to show up on point i think he's going to be able to stop the takedowns and i think he's going to clip chaos with something uh I actually don't see this fight going past the minute and a half uh, excuse me the round and a half mark so i'm gonna go with Razak inside one yeah, we agree on that as well. Maybe we'll see the rest of the card. But uh, yeah, I just, I'm just i a big believer in Al-Hassan. I thought that last fight, you know what? Long layoff. Let's see how he looks with a full camp now. I think he's going to be back better than ever. And, and I got to say this about that last fight too. I mean, obviously, you're right. Long layoff, was dealing with a bunch of stuff outside the octagon and missed weight, all that stuff. But that kid Munir Lezez is pretty legit, man. That kid yep, uh, that is... <laughs> <laughs> he's very well rounded. He's massive for the weight class. He's just like one of those undiscovered gems that no one really knew about. But now we know who he is, James. So I can't wait to see what that kid does down the line. Uh, maybe chaos becomes a, a great prospect too. I kind of got to see it to believe it. So I'm rolling with uh, Razak Al Hassan here. Love it. Sounds good. Now, next up in the middleweight division, here's where things get interesting, James. We got Sean Strickland making a quick turnaround against Brendan Allen. And the thing I love about this is that both guys are making a quick turnaround. I mean, Brendan Allen, I know he didn't officially compete last week, but he he made 185 pounds. He cut weight, you know, uh, last week. So he got his show money. He's coming back here. And I think this is a striker versus grappler type matchup. Look, in certain fights, you know, like Sean Strickland will be the more well-rounded fighter than certain guys. Like I thought against Jack Marshman that if Sean Strickland really wants to make this an easier fight, he can go out here and take down a guy like Jack Marshman. But he actually wanted to beat him at his own game. He stood up and traded with him for three straight rounds. I think it's going to be a little bit harder to take down a guy like Brendan Allen in this spot. I think that Sean Strickland, it'll behoove him to keep this one standing light him up with that jab and i actually liked how strickland looked at 185 pounds but listen man brendan allen is a serious specialist and you know if you put a bet on sean strickland and brendan allen takes his back i know i know it's going to be a sweat yeah this is another tough fight you're looking at the odds right now on blitzbud.eu no one is uh, like i mean there's i think uh, strickland's a slight underdog here which makes sense because you know he looked fantastic at middleweight and it's funny you'd think that allen would be a lot bigger than him not really you look at the height and reach Allen's got like a slight height, uh, height and reach advantage in this fight. Not by much, though. Um, I do wonder, like, with Allen, you know, getting ready to fight Heinish and all the emotion that went into that, you know, they didn't like each other. And then having that canceled and now trying to get into that mode again, I wonder how that affects him. It, it affects fighters differently. I mean, we, we can't go into the psyche unless I can analyze Brendan Allen's brain. I don't know how he's going to feel about that. But I do wonder about that, that, you know, you're thinking you're going to fight and then you got to reset things and, and go back to action. Here's the one thing that's a little bit worrisome, uh, Dan. I don't know if you caught this, but when the initial Heinish fight got, uh, you know, taken off the card, Alan put a tweet out saying, I- I'm going home. I'm not going to fight again until next year. Now he is here fighting Strickland. So I do wonder mentally if maybe for a little bit he might have checked out and said, you know what, I don't want to fight right now. But we'll see. I- if I'm going on paper, I, I think Alan is-, is the better fighter in terms of, what, you know, the ground game. I think he if he does get this to the mat, I think he's got a clear advantage there. And I think his striking has definitely improved as well, too, under Henry Hoof. Um, I-, I think we're going to see that on display in this fight. So um, this is one of those fights. If you guys are going to bet, I would recommend staying away because I just I-, I think, you know, Sean Strickland could look amazing. Right. We've only seen one fight of his at middleweight, uh, at least recently. So he could come out and look guns a blazing. But. Just like the Allen Heinish fight, this is just razor close in my opinion. But if I have to give an edge, it's got to be the younger guy in Brendan Allen. 
So we're going to have our first disagreement here. There we well, go. We're, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to absolutely agree that it's a pick em and that this is one of those where, man, you probably should stay away. So that much, definitely got to agree with you there. But I'm going to actually go with the guy who I think is the more well-rounded fighter. I, I view Brendan Allen as a specialist, and he's one of these guys that on his regional scene, you know, some of his losses, I, I feel like his style – you know, you have to be a black belt to to pull off his style. And back when he was a purple belt, back when he was a brown belt, you know, it would be kind of hit or miss. Whereas now he's a black belt. You see the kind of wins he's going out there and getting, beating guys like Kevin Holland. So Brendan Allen's very dangerous, and he takes Sean Strickland's back, and the fight could be over shortly after. But I think that Sean Strickland moved up to the right weight class. Uh, I loved how he looked at his last fight. Now, granted, he didn't have to stuff any takedowns there, but just the way he moved, because we had a lot of questions going into it, James. We were wondering... How's he going to look after the motorcycle accident, the layoff, the surgery, the whole bit? And it looked like looked pretty damn good to me. It looked like his uh, frame has really filled out at 185 pounds. And I feel like if he can keep this fight standing, if he can stuff these takedowns of Brendan Allen or weather an early storm of Brendan Allen, that he can kind of take over in the second and third rounds, pop that jab, and kind of win this decision. So I'm going to lean with uh, Sean Strickland in this spot. There we go. Glad we disagree on something. But of all fights, I'm glad it's this one because this, like I said, very, very, very uh, tough to pick in my opinion. Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up that... Uh that tweet he put out as well. Like, I'm curious, like how quickly did that, you know, change things for him? But on the flip side, it's not like Strickland had an opponent he was getting ready for either. He also mm -hmm. took this on short notice as well. So it's really short notice for both guys. And then the Henry hoof dangle, which I'm glad you brought up. I want to see what kind of improvements Brendan Allen's made yep. under Henry hoof. Like I want to see, is he a completely different guy? Is he sharp? Is he slightly, you know, more polished, more sharp? Because now we know what Sean Strickland looks like now at 185 pounds. And, I liked what I saw and interesting, like he, interestingly enough, he, he felt so unthreatened by Jack Marshman that, you know, he's out there talking to him. He's saying, Jack, why won't you fall? Like Jack, if you'd fall, I'd get a 50 K bonus right now. And then he's saying stuff like Jack, 30 seconds left. I'm going to give you a chance to win. Like he was talking to him. I have a feeling he's not going to be talking to Brendan Allen. You have to take a fight against a guy like Brendan Allen extremely seriously. And not only that, Brendan Allen poses a serious threat on the mat as well. So I think we're going to see a more focused Sean Strickland in there. But that being said, if he can weather this early ground storm and get this to the second and third round, that's where I see Sean Strickland taking over and possibly winning a decision here. You know, I was trying to think as well, just quickly, as we're wrapping things up on this fight. Um, you know, I remember Brendan Allen. He had an opponent on the regional scene, Charlie Raider. He was on the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, Allen fought him early in his career. And that's about the only time I ever remember Allen fighting someone that sort of talked some trash. And it did not go well for Charlie. Allen ended up winning that fight decisively. But you notice that's, you know, Brendan's a pretty nice guy. We've seen him in interviews and stuff. You know, if Strickland does try and do that, I am curious to see how Allen will react. I know he's a lot more mature now than he was back then. But I just remember in that fight where it looked like Raider was trying to get under his skin and Brendan was having none of it. And this was back when Brendan was in his early 20s. So I'm just I am curious if Strickland does try that and see what happens and see if it affects Brendan because, uh, you know, early on in his career, he had an opponent like that and he was able to sort of overcome it. So we'll see if it plays a role in the fight or not. I'm glad you brought that up. Charlie Raider, ultimate fighter veteran. We remember him from the show for sure. You know, interesting enough, Brendan is still in his early 20s, man. I'm, I know, always, 25. I'm, I'm always surprised when I see the guy's age. I'm like, man, he's so young. He's just a kid. And I think that's that's one of the best parts about him is that you are seeing big improvements every single time we see him. You are seeing an evolution in his game. Now he's doing a, a camp down in Florida. You know, he's getting outside his comfort zone. So I love seeing stuff like that. And then with Strickland, you love to see the fact that he's overcome adversity. He's starting to feel at home in his new weight class. So I agree with this fight being a, a dead pick -em. And, you know, just to point out, uh, Vegas said slight lean on Sean Strickland. That doesn't mean they're right. That's just kind of, mm -hmm. just, I just wanted to point that out. They were saying, you know, minus 125, minus 150 for Strickland. Now it's minus 110. I actually agree with the public action. I do think it should be minus 110. But once again, I'm going to lean with Strickland. Let's, let's see what happens, James. Yeah, we'll see. Great fight. Uh, great addition, I should say, to this card. And speaking of a return, we got the return of Julian Marquez, and he's taking on Sapper Beg Safarov. And man, Julian Marquez is a very exciting guy. You know, I, I know you remember on Contender Series when he knocked out Phil Haas. I know you remember when he finished Darren Stewart in the UFC. So he's already beat some guys uh, up until this point in his career. He had the very close fight with uh, Alessio Di Carico. I think it might have been 
one of the fights of the night, but I think he might have missed weight so he didn't get his bonus or, or yeah. something like that, or maybe it wasn't fight of the night, but I just know it was a very exciting three-round brawl with Alessio Di Carico. Um, do you by chance know like what the injuries had or why he's been gone for so yeah, long? Yeah, I'm trying to remember because uh, I actually did interview him actually in Vegas during uh, the whole injury thing when he was off, and I, I want to say it was an arm thing, but I do remember him mentioning that this was something that could have ended his career. So there was that thought in his head where he said, you know, this might be it for me. So the fact that he's coming back and getting this fight is, is huge for him. And he was supposed to have a fight uh, earlier and then it ended up getting bumped. Right. So, uh, so the fact that he's fighting so late, I mean, la his last fight, the Trico fight was uh, July of 2018. So huge layoff for Marquez, but you know, it's crazy. I was just looking at his, um, his age. Julian's still only 30. Like you lost two years of your career, but you're still under 30 or you are 30 now. Like he's just entering the prime of his career right now. But uh, yeah, to answer your question, um, I think it was something with his arm, but uh, it was one of those things where they couldn't figure out exactly what the issue was because he had a lot of problems with it, but apparently everything's A-OK -okay now. That's good to hear. Yeah, so we'll see how he rebounds. And I, I think this is a bit of a, you know, not, not to disrespect a guy like Safarov who's stepped inside the octagon more than once, but I, I do think this is a bit of a layup fight. You know, I, I think if his name was Saperbeg Johnson instead of Saperbeg Safarov, that the odds would be a little bit wider. You know, I think that, you know, just the fact that he's Russian, he gets a lot of respect because for the most part, Russians are some of the most elite fighters on planet Earth. But I would actually put Saperbeg Safarov kind of towards the lower totem pole uh, of the Russians in, in my rankings. Um, I, I think that, you know, he's got a serious knee injury himself where, you know, you kind of see him kind of hobbling around on one leg in a lot of these fights, and it doesn't seem like he's got his mobility under him. And not only that, he can kind of be overpowered as well. But it's going to actually be interesting. This fight's at 185, right? Not at 205? Yeah, it's at, it's at 185, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, because uh, I, I know that we saw Saperbeg, you know, at 205 against Jean Vellante. So we've seen him at 205 before, so it's going to be interesting seeing him at 185. But that being said, man, I, I got to give the speed advantage to a guy like Marquez. Um, I, I just think he's the more well-rounded fighter here. And unless his injury is really debilitated, debilitating him, I think he's the more durable guy here too. Yeah, I'm with you here. Um, it's an interesting matchup because like you said, Safarov really has not been impressive at all. He fought at late heavy. He actually fought in middleweight in his last fight against Saviera, um, but that was you know a, a bad performance. He got submitted in the first round in that fight. So I think you know what you're going to get with Safarov. This is a good test for Marquez because of the layoff, because he came off a loss in his last fight. He had some weight cut issues. Interesting thing with this camp, uh, Dan, is that Julian Marquez went back to Missouri. He's at Glory MMA for this camp, which is where he started. So he's getting to train under James Krause, who, you know, we all know is one of the best coaches in the world and, you know, getting to work with his old team. And I, I just, you know, speaking to him, I actually spoke to him before the original scheduled fight. Um, and he just talked about how he just feels more at ease here, getting the type of quality training he has. One of the things I've heard about syndicate MMA is that the, the schedule there is a little bit looser. It's not as strict, whereas Krause runs a really tight ship. So I think for a guy like Julian, who has, you know, admitted himself, he can be a bit undisciplined. I think this is actually a really good move for him being back there and getting the type of training that he needs at this point. So I think it's even possible we'll see an even better Julian Marquez than the one we saw in the Decirio fight. So I am curious to see uh, him being back at his roots, so to speak, if he looks even better. But I think Marquez finishes this fight unless that injury, like you said, is has done something really bad or unless the layoff has really affected him. I mean, uh, you know, we saw Brian Ortega kind of smash that myth a few weeks ago, but we'll, we'll see. But I think on paper, you got to go with the guy who's better. And that is Julian Marquez. Brian Ortega and Sean Strickland. So That's yeah, right. yeah, I could call it's one of those things where it's just, it, it's all about the individual, you know, it's like, what has he been doing in his off time? Um, has his preparation been on point and, and, and all those things. And also just, uh, you know, on a side note, I believe he might have started a podcast with Kendra Lust uh, in his off time uh, on these two years off. Is that true? He has. Uh, you might be talking to someone who actually edits that podcast every week, Dan. I don't know if you're aware of that. That's so bias awesome. aside, bias, bias aside, I, uh, yeah, I, I still would favor Julian here. It could be someone I don't like, and I'd still have to look on paper as, uh, <laughs> as, as far as who they're doing, but no, Julian, uh, you know, and good on him for doing that. And he's, he's actually, Julian has been doing a lot of things outside the cage, like in terms of his brand and all that, that's really sort of setting him out, setting himself up for things outside of uh, fighting as well. So that's another thing to consider as well, that like, he doesn't have to fight, right? Like he had the, you know, the bad injury, but he's got opportunities outside the cage that are, that are going quite well for him. So, um, I, I think, you know, that's another thing to consider. It's not like he needs to fight. He's just doing it because he loves it so much. Yeah, you love to see stuff like that when, when fighters are broadening their their horizons and, you know, they're taking advantage of, hey, this is my window, uh, you know, in this career. Let's make the most out of it. So I'm really happy to see that he's doing stuff like that. And he's always been an exciting fighter, man. I mean, these fights we've seen in the UFC on Contender Series, he brings it every single time. So I think he's got a willing dance partner. You know, with a guy like Safarov, it I, I don't like bringing up the fact that, you know, sometimes he does do some dirty techniques, you know, grabbing the cage, the eye pokes, the low blows, but 
he does do some stuff like that. So it's going to be interesting to see if, you know, if he mixes in any of those tactics here against a guy like Julian Marquez at all. But, you know, aside from all that, I, I do think that this is a good opportunity for Marquez to get his feet back, get to get his feet wet back inside the octagon and know what it's like to step in there again and no crowd. That's going to be really interesting. Maybe they start talking to each other a bit. Maybe there's a bit of a dialogue in there, you know, uh, Amer- uh, America versus Russia. But yeah. I'm going, I'm going Julian Marquez here. One more quick thing I just remembered. Uh, they had Brian Ortega on their podcast a few weeks ago. And of course, we just mentioned how Ortega got that huge win after a long layoff. And Ortega gave some pretty good advice in that interview because I was able to check it out. And uh, Julian sort of told me after, he's like, man, that's exactly what I needed to hear because there's that self-doubt, right? And Ortega sort of talks about that in the interview. So uh, I don't know if that'll play a role or not, but I just thought that was interesting that Julian mentioned that to me, that he's like, man, Ortega really inspired me uh, you know, ahead of this fight. So we'll see if that plays a role in Saturday's fight or not. I'm glad you brought that up because I mean... Uh, I think it might have been Tim Sylvia who said the quote that fighting fighting is uh, ninety percent uh, half mental or, or something among those lines. Yeah, he probably said it wrong. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. It, it was something like that. So yeah, I mean, it, you know, to to get reassurance from a guy like that coming off that layoff, who just had an amazing five round performance, to have him tell you that. It's got to be a big boost in his confidence. So I'm glad you brought that up, James. Absolutely, that's what you get here. You get a little bit extra on the show. So yes, yes, yes. <laughs> So also in the middleweight division, we got Eric, your boy Anders, taking on Antonio Ahoyo. And this is an interesting fight as well, man. You know, uh, obviously your boys had some mixed results, but he's also been in there with some really tough competition, man. I mean, he's a guy who took a, a fight with Tiago Mejeda Santos on five days short notice. They call him on Monday. He goes and fights him on Saturday, you know. So he's just the guy I got so much respect for. And, you know, he's transitioned from a different sport, from football to to, to the UFC, man. It's uh. It's crazy how he's done it, man. And um, yeah, so as far as this matchup is concerned, one thing about Ahoyo that we got to talk about is his kicking game. I think that's the best part of his game, bar none. He is a serious, serious kicker. And if Eric stands on the outside with a guy like Ahoyo, he could be he could get lit up here. But aside from that, man, I think if Eric can kind of close that distance and, you know, start to kind of fight in boxing range, maybe try to mix in some takedowns, get this against the, the cage, you know, in the clinch. I think Eric does have some advantages here, but I would give the kicking advantage and the speed advantage to Antonio Ahoyo. But everything else, I actually side with Eric Anders. Yeah, I'm with you there, too. A couple of interesting things about Anders, because I did have a chance to speak with him before this one. So he cornered Walt Harris on Fight Island. He actually didn't go back to Alabama because there, you know he couldn't train with Walt. And I think there was a lot of people sort of out of the gym. So he actually stayed in Vegas the rest of camp. Um, so he's getting to go to the PI. He's getting to go to Extreme Couture. There's a lot of middleweight bodies there. So I think that was actually a better move for him as opposed to going back home with training with nobody. So that is a little bit interesting. The other thing that stood out to me when I spoke to him is he, he hated that Jocko fight. Like, he didn't even want to talk about it. He's like, dude, I'm in embarrassed like he's like that was like one of the worst performances ever and i agree that's a fight he should have won dan i mean on paper that was a fight where anders had some advantages he wasn't able to take advantage here so with that in mind i think anders knows he's got to put it into high gear here and get a big win and i think with the fact like you mentioned the kicks the speed we'll see if he can handle that you know he did get his legs sort of chopped up by khalil roundtree a few fights ago so i think hopefully he's learned his lesson that hey maybe i got to check those leg kicks but we will see what happens in this matchup here but the thing i like about anders you mentioned it fighting top level competition i thought he beat machida a couple years ago I thought, you know, that Santos fight was pretty competitive until Santos sort of took over and obviously finished uh, Anders in that matchup. But in general, it's not like Anders is going out there and getting absolutely destroyed. He's having fights where he's sort of in it. So that gives me hope that he can turn things around in this fight. And the experience is sort of what I look at here. Arorio, he's only got one fight in the UFC. He lost it. He had that nice win on Contender Series by submission. But, you know, Anders has got a pretty solid ground game as well. He's got a pretty good takedown defense too. So I think Anders probably wins this. But again, this is another fight where I'm kind of like, Ugh, I don't know which way I'm going. Like, I'll pick Anders. I think, you know, with the experience, you have to give him the slight edge here. But I do worry because it's like, if Anders looks anything like he did in that Jocko fight, there's no way I can feel confident picking him here. But I am because I think he's got more experience. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, no need to force a bet. You're allowed to sit back and enjoy this as a fan. But uh, as far as the Jocko fight, I mean, I, I agree with your points. You know, it wasn't Eric's best performance, but I, I view this as a different matchup. You know, I think that Jocko is actually kind of one of the best point fighters in the middleweight division. And he's kind of been, you know, either in the top 15 or around the top 15 for, for a majority of his career. And it was just a very tough stylistic matchup with Eric. You know, Eric does better when guys are kind of aggressive uh, mm-hmm. uh, against him. And I think that's kind of what Ahoyo brings to the table. And in being more aggressive, that's going to give Eric more more openings. Because if you're kind of patient with Eric, he'll be patient back too. And that's when he can go out there and kind of lose a couple decisions. But um, 
Unlike Jocko, I think Ahoyo is going to go right after him. And like I said, at kicking range, that's where Ahoyo has a big edge. And to to speak about Ahoyo's UFC debut against Andre Muniz, y'all got to look out for Andre Muniz, man. He is a serious black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You saw some of the sweeps he had in that fight, uh, some of the takedowns, and even his subsequent fight with Bartos Fabinski when he tapped him out in the first round. Uh, Andre Muniz is one of the one of the best jiu-jitsu guys in the middleweight division, so keep an eye out for him. But similar to this being a different matchup for Eric, you know, than Jocko, this is a different matchup for uh, Arroyo than uh, Muniz was, you know, because you don't have to worry about, you know, a third-degree black belt uh, in Muniz, you know, going out there, getting on top of a guy like Arroyo. And I got to give Arroyo a lot of credit. He survived a serious black belt in um in Muniz and I think that Ahoyo might only be a purple belt so that's a that's got to be good for his confidence to know that hey I can hang with an elite black belt I can survive and uh this time so Anders is obviously not you know a black belt on the level of uh of Muniz but I think he might actually be a brown belt and you know I think he's got some pretty competent grappling I mean you saw his fight with my head like I said he took that on five days short notice he took down my head of Santos he took his back you know with ease actually in that spot it's just that he didn't have a full camp. He kind of gassed out a little bit. He wasn't able to not only stand up, he wasn't able to answer the bell between rounds. It was, uh, you know, you got, you gotta, you gotta train for a, for a fight, man. You gotta have the the full amount of time. So I'm actually, you know, back to the main event. It's gonna be interesting to see what happens with Felder in, in this spot, you know, knowing that he took this on five day short notice if the fight is contested at a very uh, high pace, but back to, um, to Anders, if Anders can get this in boxing range, if he can get this up against the fence, if he can mix in takedowns, I think that he can kind of edge this one out. So I'm going to go with uh, your boy, Eric Anders. Now, James Lynch, in the Bantamweight division, this is going to be a lot of fun because well, when was the last time you saw a boring Lewis Smolka fight? <laughs> we got uh, Lewis Smolka versus Mexico's own Jose Teco Quinones. And I mean, even if you didn't tell me who the two fighters were, if you just told me it's Mexico versus Hawaii, you know, you know I'm tuning in for that because those the people from those places are known for coming out there and having serious fights. And, you know, Luis Smolka, he, he's an inspiration, man, because I know you remember a couple of years back, you know, he, he was dealing with some stuff. He, he admitted, you know, publicly he had a bit of a drinking problem. And even if you go back, hear some of those past interviews, it was kind of rough, man. So he picked himself back up. He put the bottle down, and he's come back to the UFC. He's gotten two big wins. You know, he beat Suma Darji. He beat Ryan Main Event McDonald. He's also had some tough setbacks, but, you know, I think that Casey Kenny and, um, you know, Matt Schnell were, were tough fights for him at any point in his career. I, I don't think that it had it, it, all it had to do with he was simply outgunned in those spots. But here against Teco Quinones, th this is an interesting fight because I would say that if this fight ends inside the distance, that that favors Lewis Smolka. But if this fight goes all three rounds, I would actually favor Teco there. So I'm actually curious to kind of see how this one plays out, James. Yeah, it's really interesting. Quinones has been like the guy they give to these prospects to try and build them up, right? Remember, he had to fight Nathaniel Wood, and then he had to fight Sean O'Malley as well. And, a lot, you know, obviously lost both those fights, actually was finished in both those matchups. And I kind of feel like even though Smolka is, you know, not really a prospect anymore, he's 29 years old, he's been in the UFC for a while, um, I still kind of feel like it's a fight where they kind of want to get Smolka back to, back to prominence a little bit here in this one. That's how I look at this matchup from the outside. I don't think they're that sold on Quinones as a fighter. Uh, but you bring up a good point that, like, yeah, if it goes to the distance, Quinones is that guy. I mean, we saw that fight against, um, who is it, uh, Ishihara, um, where, you know, he, he won a decision decisively. And that was a fight where I think Ishihara had a lot of hype going in. So he was able to spoil the party there. What Smolka needs to do is just be more confident. Go out there and really, you know, try and... You know, just be a lot more technical. With the Casey Kenny fight, I feel like he kind of just had a lapse in that one. Kenny was able to take advantage because Kenny's not really a finisher. We saw his last two fights; they were dominant, but they weren't stoppages. So the fact that Smolka got finished so quickly is a little bit concerning. But I think if he's able to sort of overcome that, go back to basics, really go back to his striking and go back to his ground game as well, and just really sort of implement his game, I think he has a path to victory here. But uh, you know, kind of like a lot of fights on this card, it, it kind of depends on which fighter is going to show up. But I think Smolka is going to win this one. I think you know the last fight he just ran into a guy who's red hot in Casey Kenny. I think he gets back on the winning track in this one and hopefully has the type of performance like he had in Vancouver when he knocked out Ryan McDonald, like you mentioned. Um, I'm just not that sold on Quinones. I think the ceiling is higher on Lewis Smolka, so that's why I'm going to take him this fight. Yeah, I mean, Lewis Smolka is definitely a fan favorite because win, lose, or draw, he always comes to fight. I mean, if he loses the fight, it's not because, you know, he, he didn't show up. He'll go, the guy will go out on his shield. So, and also, I know you remember that Tim Elliott fight where they broke a DraftKings record and they were just scrambling nonstop for three straight rounds. So, it's always exciting to see him fight. So, with Teco Quinones, it's kind of interesting because he 
kind of should have won the Ultimate Fighter Latin America, the first ever one with him and Alejandro Perez. It was the same season that Yair won up a weight class. And what kind of happened was that Teco, I believe, someone can correct me, it's been a long time since it happened, but I believe he might have lost one or two points in his fight against Alejandro Perez, which actually got Alejandro the decision. But had there been no point deductions, Teco might have actually won that decision. And we might be looking at him as the first ever Ultimate Fighter Latino America winner. And I think that he's he's somewhat of a well-rounded guy. You know, he's one of these guys that... He's kind of known, you know, he's from Mexico, so he's known for his boxing a little bit. But we've been seeing him come out here and mixing takedowns, too. And it, one thing with Smolka is that Smolka's hands have been getting a lot better. I mean, you saw the main event McDonald fight, even the Casey Kenny fight up until the finish. It looked like uh, Louis Smolka was doing some work. He was going to the body really nicely. He's kind of like a Hawaiian Diaz brother in a way, you know. Uh, but that being said, so like I said. If this fight ends inside the distance, I favor Smolka. If it goes the distance, I favor uh, Teco Quinones. But I have to give a pick here. And, man, I, I feel like Teco, if he plays this smart, he can come out here and win this fight. Don't get into a brawl with Lewis Smolka. You know, don't don't get into a firefight. Because one thing about Teco, he doesn't have the best chin in the world. And it's not just because he got knocked out against O'Malley. Actually, if you go back to his regional fights... Because, you know, he's a 135-er. He, he took a fight against Davi Hamosh, who's a 155-er. And it was one of the most brutal knockouts I've ever seen, James. And since that point, his chin hasn't been the same. Like, I know he's been winning a lot of these fights, but he's actually been wobbled in a lot of these fights. So if he kind of comes out here and bangs with Smolka, I think that he could possibly get rocked or knocked out again. But I think if he plays the smart, kind of keeps this on the outside, pumps those feints, and mixes in takedowns, Smolka's only got a 30% takedown defense. And I know Smolka's one of these guys that historically... He'll give up a bad position so he can kind of scramble out. And then when he gets on top, he's heavy on top. He's got some great ground and pound. He's a great scrambler. So you got to give him a lot of credit on the mat. But I think some of the work that teco has been doing at Alliance, you know, with guys like Dominic Cruz and Jeremy Stevens, they've gotten his well-rounded MMA game on point. And I think that if he plays this smart, he can come out here, kind of keep it close standing, but mix in takedowns and kind of hold that top control and win a decision. So I'm going to lean with Teco Quinones to win a decision in this spot. There we go. Another disagreement and another fight I could see absolutely going this way because again like that one of the things i like about this card a lot of close matchups in my opinion and last but not least in the welterweight division we got alex morano taking on reese mckee and james uh you know you mentioned how alex morano we both mentioned how you know it didn't go his way his last fight you know whenever he fights in houston uh, people are hitting him up for tickets you know he, he feels like he's a bit distracted there he feels like he's being you know pulled from all kinds of different directions but now you know he's had a serious camp for this one and i actually heard you did an interview with reese mckee and he kind of views this like his ufc debut you know he views like this is a, a chance to go out there and really show that hey this is my real ufc debut i'm not fighting hamza himayev anymore so what kind of insight can you give us uh, from reese mckee here yeah, that's the biggest thing. He just wanted to get in the UFC. I don't think it mattered the opponent. And, you know, kudos to him. A lot of guys would not fight Hamzat Shimaev. So the fact that he went in there and actually took that fight, good on him. The one thing I was a little bit surprised is that he's staying at welterweight. I figured he might want to drop down a weight class. He had fought at lightweight before, but talking to him in the interview, he mentioned how tough of a cut it was and how he enjoys the fact that he doesn't have to worry about the weight cut in his matchup. So I kind of don't get this fight from the UFC's perspective. Like, I don't know what they're trying to do. Maybe is the case if they think that McKee is the real deal and he can beat Morono. I don't know. But Morono's like, I mean, he's not not old he's 30 years old but uh i, I just i wonder what sort of the, the the thinking is with this one because it's like both these guys are great and they're exciting so it's like why put them together so soon but anyways um morono I, I like i said i think that last fight if they if he fought chaos williams nine times out of ten i think he probably wins that fight i think it was just an off night for for morono he's got some good wins already you know max griffin was a win that he had before that zach Otto, we finished him keenan song the jordan mean fight another mulligan uh, you know maybe it's uh Calgary's kind of similar to Texas a little bit. Maybe that was the issue in losing that fight as well. Uh, there's a lot of Cowboys out there. Josh Berkman, another good <laughs> win. I know Berkman's not, uh, you know, obviously on the, uh, I don't think he's even fighting anymore, but you kind of get where I'm going with this is that I think that Morono, um, you know, ever since he's gone to Fortis, we've seen leaps and bounds in his game, especially with the striking. We've seen more knockouts in these fights and stuff. And I see this being another really close fight here. And even though in a situation like this, normally I would go with the younger guy, I actually favor Morono in this fight, not only because I think he comes from a great camp, but also the fact that he's just got way more experience. This is, he's been in the UFC, people forget, since 2016. So he's been trying to find his gear for a while. He's still only 30. Whereas McKee, 
you know, he fought in a great promotion in Cage Warriors, but you go back and look at some of those competitors there. I mean, just a couple fights ago, he fought a guy who was nine and six. Like, that's not going to cut it in the UFC, and you got to get sort of those levels. And, you know, it, we can almost just erase that UFC debut with McKee because, again, most people lose to Shimaev, but I do have my concerns about him in terms of the level of competition. So for that reason... I'm going Alex Morono in this fight. I think the big question is, can he finish it? I think he can. I think that knockout comes maybe in the second round, but I think Morono comes out and looks like the Alex Morono we've seen in so many other fights where he just looks amazing. So I'm curious to get your take on this, Dan, because I'm very high on Alex Morono. Yeah, man. I feel like I kind of have like not the best read on Reese McKee because most of his fights have been at 155 pounds and you know he's a very tall guy he's a six foot two man with a 78 inch reach right so he's gonna have the height advantage he's gonna have a six inch reach advantage here over Murano does he look completely different at 170 pounds that's the big question for me because you know in the last fight against Himayev I mean he'd lose to Himayev at any weight class so that didn't really let us know what what this guy's gonna look like at 170 pounds so the big question to me is is he a brand new man at 170 pounds or not because if it's the guy at 155 pounds then I definitely got Alex Morano uh, the guy at 155 pounds it, it seems like he eats too many clean punches man he kind of has a bit of that tall man defense which you know, eventually that stuff catches up to you. I know exactly. I know you know what I'm talking about, James. I do. So, I know exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of stuff catches up to you, man. And it's like, will this move up to 170 pounds make a difference or not? You know, that that's my big question here because Alex Morano, I mean, there is a path to go out here and beat a guy like that. But at the same time, if you're not quite ready for Alex Morano, I mean, not only will he tee off on you, but he'll teach you a lesson in there. I mean, he's the guy that, like you said, has been in the UFC for a while. He goes forward. He's got serious pressure. Actually, a black belt in jujitsu, too. He can throw bombs. So I have to lean with Alex Morano because it's interesting because when I saw the plus 170 on Reese McKee, I was like, Let's look into this. This could be a possible underdog. But then I go back and revisit his career, and I can't say I was that impressed. The way he kind of won these fights was like, first round, he'd kind of walk these guys down. He'd like eat every shot they throw at him, and eventually they'd slow down. Then he'd kind of take over, right? And you know firsthand that that style does, is not going to work forever. So I want to know, does he move better at 170 pounds? Is he more you know, defensively aware? You know, things among those lines. So maybe he looks like a brand new man. And if he does, then there's some value on him here. But I, I can't, you know predict things like that i have to go based off what i've seen on tape and what i've seen on tape is i think he's very hittable and i think this is a spot that alex morano can capitalize on so i'm gonna agree with you on this one i'm gonna go with the favorite alex morano to get it done and i think he's gonna rebound in style there you go agree again but uh i'm telling you there's something about some of these four guys i think they're gonna really impress that uh, on this card uh, including morano and uh, al hassan in this fight so we'll see we'll see if i'm right but if not you know obviously you guys know where to find me on twitter <laughs> well, it's a great camp nonetheless. So, I mean, look, sometimes they're going to have on nights, sometimes they're going to have off nights. But regardless, I mean, when you got a guy like Coach Safe Sayud, you know, in your corner, it's only going to, you know, propel you to that next level. So I cannot wait to see that as well. Well, James Lynch, thank you very much for joining me on the special edition of the Line Movement MMA betting show. We truly appreciate it. Uh, the fans can follow you at Lynch on Sports. They can follow me at Best Fight Picks. Make sure you all subscribe to Line Movement. Go uh, to Twitter at line underscore movement. Subscribe to this video. Give it a like. want to thank everybody behind the scenes. Our producer, Jordan, Brian, Nick, Joe, Dan. Uh, shout out to Dan Tom. Uh, you know, uh, my, my normal co-host. Thanks, James Lynch, for filling in for him. I uh, hope Dan Tom is doing well. I know he'll be back soon. And thanks again to all our supporters, all our listeners, all our fans. We're going to be back next week for the next card. And uh, we're going to finish out this year strong. So everybody stay safe. Enjoy the fights. And we'll speak soon. Thanks for watching this video. If you like this content, you're going to like even more stuff we got here on the Line Movement channel. Uh, make sure you subscribe and hit a like on the video.